Yeah, we are the real America. Um, can I have the first one, please? Okay. Here we have it, the World Land Bridge. And what I would like people to, uh, what I would like to focus on when we look at uh, this planet, this globe of ours, if you see these blue lines, uh, spanning from the southern part of Africa to the southern part, through Eurasia to the southern part of uh, Ibero, of Latin America. Um, this is a world uh, where man and the welfare of man is in the center. That is, how, can we, how do we take this planet of ours and treat it as our garden? How can we make this the most profitable, the most beautiful, the most clean, wonderful planet for human beings to be in, where every single baby being born will get the optimal possibilities for developing his or her capabilities. In other words, this is an anti-colonial, anti-imperial program. This is what the World Land Bridge represents. Uh, if you look in history, and I'm not going to, I'm going to, what I want to do today is to give a brief history of the ideas leading up uh, 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 to this world land bridge of Lyndon and Helga LaRouche. Uh, but, but what we have seen through the centuries concerning empire is if you look at Africa still uh, under the uh, yoke of colonialism, uh, you look at how uh, Europe uh, again and again and again through the centuries where the countries were set up against each other by the empire so you could get people to fight and uh, sit and control them from outside. You had the whole period with the transport of slaves. You had the opium, you had the same thing, the same phenomena that you had in um, Europe, you had in Asia, setting up the nations against each other, trying to prevent by all means that people, that the, that the nation states would collaborate uh, with each other for mutual development. And, um, what the World Land Bridge represent is a, a, a complete uh, new shift, a complete shift that the world has never seen before, where oligarchism is wiped out and where uh, the uh, nations collaborate with each other for the utmost development and prosperity that mankind has ever seen. And everything is, has been done through the centuries to stop this. And we know what the situation is today. It, this has always been a nightmare for the, uh, for the imperial forces that uh, the land masses would be developed. Um, like a, a guy called Adam Brooks, uh, who is one of the descendants of John Quincy Adams, not a good descendant, he wrote in 1901 where there were some efforts to create collaboration. He said, we must make sure that the land people, that the Asians and the Europeans never succeed in developing the land in between because then we, the maritime powers, will have lost our power forever. And the oceans, they are our lakes and this is how we must make sure that they continue to be. So, um, so this is what I would like people to have in their mind because this is what this represents. This is what also the founding principles of the United States represent. Uh, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, namely for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is reflected in the preamble uh, that uh, we must secure the welfare of the people and, the and the, we must look after the future, the posterity. And that goes for every single baby in the world, whether you're born in South Africa, in Denmark, in Nicaragua, or in the United States. Uh, people have those rights, these inalienable rights, all over the globe. And that is what the land bridge represents. And that is, uh, if, uh, with us winning the war in the United States to get the technicality of Glass-Steagall through and getting Obama out, we are on an absolute edge where we could have a complete shift for a uh, renaissance and a development that mankind has never ever seen before. So I just wanted to have that in, in, uh, in the back of people's mind, that this is the fight against oligarchism. 
And when you see these lines across uh, the, the, the big pl uh, the planet here behind me, uh, we have termed them development corridors because this is not just railroads. Uh, this is banned when you see these, when you saw this, uh, these development corridors spanning from southern Africa to southern Latin America. You're, th you're talking about 150 kilometers, about 100 miles broad bands with uh, fast speed rail, uh, cities, nuclear power plants, water management, and so forth. You, uh, these 100 miles uh, broad, you can, talk, you can think about a world assembly line on a very high level of transport, energy production, water management, building of cities, where when you build such uh, corridors, you make the land alive. You'll be able to grow modern agriculture. You'll be able to mine areas we have never been able to mine before. We'll be able to process it, and we'll be able to transport the goods uh, by, through the transport um, by rail, and so forth through uh, these development corridors. That is, we will make land that today is totally unproductive and not used productive. Uh, next. Uh, I would like to uh, go through some of the beginning of an idea for really developing the land masses, and here the Eurasian land mass historically, because on the planet, 80% of the land is, of the land is landlocked, and therefore, for the maritime powers, as I mentioned before, if you can control key choke points in the world, like in Gibraltar and other key areas, and control the ocean and prevent collaboration among <coughs> nations, then you can have your empire and have the easy control. So many years ago, a good friend of Lyndon Rouge and our organization, Leibniz. He, in the last 30 years of his life, he uh, was in a very close correspondence with missionaries in China. He was very engaged in China in the last 30 years of his life. And in uh, 1697, he writes in his Novissima uh, Sinica, he writes, I don't know if you can see it, but I'll, I'll read it up, maybe you can follow with me if you can see it. I consider it a singular plan of the fates that human cultivation and refinement should today be concentrated, as it were, in the two extremes of our continent, in Europe and in China, which adorns the Orient as Europe does the opposite edge of the, of the Earth. Perhaps supreme providence has ordained such an arrangement so that, as the most cultivated and distant peoples stretch out their arms to reach each other, those in between may gradually be brought to a better life, way of life. So that was Leibniz uh, in 1697. Can I have the next? This is a little older picture of the, of the gentleman. This is one of my favorite Americans, John Quincy Adams. And um, with the war of 1812, where Britain tried to uh, crush uh, the Republic. And um, at the same time you had Napoleon was urged to go into Russia, who had been our key ally earlier. Uh, John Quincy Adams, to, together with other key uh, people in America, like John Jay and others, formed an organization that they called the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions the ABCFM, and this was completely anti-colonial. What was this to do, this uh, board of commissioners? The idea was in 1812 to cross America, the continent of America, and we didn't have a transcontinental railroad at the time, so cross America and cross the Pacific and go uh, to the distant nations of Asia to spread the idea, uh, the ideas of the very best of the United States, spread the ideas of the Declaration of Independence and the preamble of the American Constitution. That is, 
It was not just to go out and convert people to Christianity. No, the idea was to go and show people uh, to do good. And what they would do, those missionaries, this is a whole big um, uh, story, so I'm being very brief. Um, the idea was to, um, what they did, they took printing machines, they took farmers with the new farm equipment, uh, they, if people where they came, for example, in Hawaii, if they didn't have a written language, they created a written language, and then they began to write books, which they printed on their printing machines. They taught the new farm, uh, farming uh, technologies, and so forth. And um, uh, the, the hub point was Hawaii. Uh, actually, because of those, that society being created in 1812. Hawaii is not today controlled by uh, Great Britain, but is American islands. But that was the hub point, and that was the key point for going further over to Asia. But those missionaries went to Indonesia, to Thailand, to Japan, and to China. And that, that what one of the, uh, if you go to a little fun thing, if you go to Washington DC, to the Washington Monument, you would see there uh, inscriptions in Chinese in the Washington Monument, which was a uh, Chinese guy that had been educated by a missionary. He was never converted to Christianity, but he was, conver he, he, uh, he was converted to the greatest ideas of the United States. And he loved George Washington and the founding fathers of the United States. So the inscription you'll see at the Washington Memorial in Chinese is a praise of George Washington and the ideas of the American Republic. That uh, movement uh, created, uh, among others by John Quincy Adams, uh, created uh, and laid the foundation for the overthrow of the emperor of China through having a very deep influence of Sun Yat-sen. Can I have the next? This is Sun Yat-sen, who, when he was 18 years old, decided that the emperor of China had to be overthrown and the republic must be created. And he worked on tiringly uh, making sure offices were created, uh, money was raised, he traveled six times around the globe at that time, organizing the Chinese revolution. Indeed, 2,100 officers were trained in different Chinatowns in the United States. Uh, and it's very doubtful that the revolution in, of China would have succeeded without those officers. Very important, uh, he, um, he got to know the highest principles of the United States and he, uh, he created something he called the three principles of the people, Sen Min Ju Yi, which he again and again would say, uh, this I have learned from Lincoln, of the people, by the people, and for the people. Um, he, uh, he emulated the best in America, but as he said, with Chinese characteristics. Uh, as he also had studied the Chinese classics of Confucius and Mencius in depth. And uh, if you study Confucius and Mencius, you will see you can take the very best from America and the very best from Christianity and uh, put that together with Confucius and Mencius and it's like one big, uh, family, so to speak, of ideas. Uh, it goes very much uh, hand in hand. And what, he, what um, after the uh, end of the First World War in 1919, Sun Yat-sen, uh, as many other people, like our own Douglas MacArthur, uh, but Sun Yat-sen warned, as did Douglas MacArthur, that with the Versailles Treaty, after the First World War, uh, the foundation was laid for a Second World War. And what Sun Yat-sen does, he writes a very comprehensive program that I will recommend people, you can find it on the internet. It's called On the International Development of China. Uh, and he writes in the preface, he says, with the Treaty of Versailles, uh, the path has now been made for a second world war. And therefore, I write this program that I call the International Development of China, but it is a program for collaboration uh, across the Eurasian uh, landmass 
for, de for mutual economic development, and that is the base basis for peace. He, his program is very detailed, including the corridors in Africa is corridors that we have proposed today. Indeed, um, many of the, most, the, the key feature of our original Eurasian land bridge was based upon Dr. Sun Yat-sen's uh, program for China from 1919. And many of the things that the Chinese government do today, like the Three Gorges Dam, the railway, uh, ra railroad development, and so forth, was based up, uh, upon Sun Yat-sen's program. It was a grand uh, program, and it was a program for peace. He wrote it in English, like what we are doing today, campaigning for the World Land Bridge and for a Pacific Orientation. He, in the danger of facing today a war, he sent this out to the different governments in the world and said this is what we must have. Uh, he got a great response from Germany. The foreign minister, Walter Rathenau, immediately sent people to Shanghai to collaborate with Sun Yat-sen's people around an idea of collaboration with Russia, China, and Germany around great development programs. Um, the response from the US at the time was that's uh, also very similar today. We, we can't afford it. Uh, so you can't afford not to do it, but they were total monetarists uh, in the US in, uh, at that time. Unfortunately, as you know, Radenau was killed. There was a tremendous pressure from the largest uh, drug bank, uh, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, that is still active today, which sent out big uh, uh, money award for killing Sun Yat-sen uh, uh, in order to stop his efforts in China. But just to give you an idea, uh, still in, um, in the 40s, this stamp is from 1942. You can see on the back of the stamp is a map of China, and then you have Lincoln on the one side, and uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen on the other side, where it says, of the people, by the people, and for the people. And then with the same meaning underneath Sun Yat-sen's picture of, uh, of the people, by the people, and for the people. The idea uh, that we have mutual uh, interest and mutual ideas. And that was uh, during, as you know, Roosevelt's time in the Second World War. That was a stamp that was printed at that time. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche, I met LaRouche in 1975, and uh, at that time he was calling for a new just world economic order. Uh, the f one of the first things in uh, Danish language was the LaRouche's proposal for an international development bank and to foster economic development. Uh, and uh, that was mentioned this morning, uh, LaRouche were very much promoting the strategic defense initiative for a mutual collaboration with the Soviet Union for mutual defense to get rid of Kissinger's mutual assured destruction policy. Um, and that was adopted by Reagan for a short period in 1983. It was also 1983 that the Rus wrote a comprehensive program for India and the whole Southeast Asia uh, of a 50-year development uh, program. But it was first in 25 years ago, almost to the day, I mean, we're just a little bit later, but in 1988, uh, October, uh, there was an absolutely historical meeting uh, in Berlin, in West, West Berlin with Lyndon LaRouche. And I will very much recommend people, it's all documentable, to uh, go in and search it and find it and see for yourself. Lyndon LaRouche had um, seen that the Soviet Union and the common con nations were soon going to collapse. And at that meeting in 1988, 25 years ago, he, say, he called for the reunification of East and West Germany. And he said such a reunification should be used to first develop Poland and then other points east. And when, so he also warned that when that happened, that uh, the British oligarchy, what they were going to do was to try to prevent it by creating a war. And LaRouche said that war will be in the Balkans because the Yugoslavia has been created so that you can pull a string and start a war. 
A year later, the wall came down, exactly what LaRouche had forecast. And um, also a war was started shortly after in the Balkans to prevent a good outcome of it. And what uh, LaRouche, uh, Linda LaRouche and Helga LaRouche immediately begun was what was mentioned this morning, was first a program, the so-called productive triangle, between uh, three cities in Europe, Vienna, Berlin, what is the third one? Paris, yeah, Vienna, Berlin, and Paris. Because the, if you, if you, at that time, if you looked at it, with that triangle, it was the most densely populated and industrial developed area in the world. And if that area would collaborate with all the capacities, it could be a major push for developing east to points east, for transport arteries and so forth. And that very fast uh, then uh, began to, we began to develop the, the, the Eurasian, the idea of the Eurasian land bridge. Next. This is July 1992, you see here on the cover of the Executive Intelligence Review, the uh, beginning of the Eurasian land bridge. And behind this is conferences, meetings, discussions with scientists of all kinds to see how to do it. I was in some of these meetings uh, where some of the things on the maps were changed, including a meeting I will never forget where LaRouche was and where I was there with a Chinese gentleman and he had maps and he said, we should change it here, and this is why we should change it. And LaRouche said, yeah, we should change it right here. So this was a live process to get this uh, uh, developed. Next. This was our Chinese newsletter, like a little mini of uh, the executive intelligence. This is from 1995. Uh, next. This is the Chinese newsletter, which we also had, of course, in the English. Since most people have not seen it, I brought the Chinese edition instead of the English. This was covered in French, in German, Chinese, English, with the lead paper being our executive intelligence review. And um, this was a coverage of a historical meeting, and it becomes more historical today because of the recent uh, proposal by Xi Jinping, the president of China, uh, this was a meeting on May the 7th to the 9th in 1996 in Beijing. This was sponsored by the Chinese government. And it was called, uh, the uh, conference was called International Symposium on Economic Development of the Regions Along the New Eurasia Continental Bridge. And they say we should call this the New Silk Road. And the conference organizer, uh, Mr. Rui, he said, I'm just giving a short little quote, he said at the conference, it is imaginable that future human society will neither be hindered by oceans nor be frustrated by severe cold, altitude, and desolation any longer. Transcontinental high-speed trains and expressways will circle the globe and bring unprecedented new opportunities for existence, development, and prosperity to human society. And a little bit later he said, uh, economic, 2,000 years ago, the ancient Silk Road linked the two continents. Economic cooperation and cultural exchanges along the ancient Silk Road had a great impact, not only on the splendid ancient civilization achieved by human society, but also on the formation of modern civilization. Up to now, it is still one of the most important spiritual ties that link Asia to Europe. And he called for calling this the modern Silk Road. So this is 70, 1996. And um, we have organized for it. We have had discussions with it, meetings. Uh, and one of the things that really spurred it, we, we made a big special report that you can still purchase. And I'll, I'll, uh, I will in, in, encourage people to study it. The Eurasian Land Bridge. It's a very comprehensive report, including things like um, uh, the, use, uh, the, the, the most efficient use of land and resources regarding transport. For example, air uses a lot of land for the, compared to what they can uh, transport. Uh, ships are the most efficient concerning uh, uh, transportation, but it's slow. 
and the very best and most efficient is rails. But they have, it's very, it goes through in detail every single region of the world what to do with uh, concerning water development, power development, transportation, new cities. Uh, because when we build these transport corridors, we build new cities and we build beautiful cities. Cities that are 750 to 1 million people and where you plan them out from the beginning so that they are beautiful and that you can get anywhere in them in 20 minutes with public transportation that is free. And then you have science centers and cultural centers in the middle, tons of trees and flowers and just really habitable places for human beings. That we can do on the Eurasian, the global world bridge, that's what we are going to do. So Helga LaRouche organizes for this like a mad woman. She travels to China again and again. This is from a meeting in New York, and she is called the Silk Road Lady. Here in New York, she is welcome. The first character means to welcome. And then the others are Xi Chou Zhe Lu Nu Shi, which means the Silk Road Lady in Chinese. And um, uh, she just conference after conference, meeting after meeting. And I'm saying this because uh, this that uh, Xi Jinping is now calling for a Silk Road today is not, it, this is something that has been fostered and fostered and discussed. And as Mr. Ding said, we realized that LaRouche was right. I want to say this year, this was 1997. This was the same year where Lynn LaRouche in the beginning of 1997 said that he warned Asia that Asian land countries before the end of 1997 were going to be attacked by a big financial wave. And I know that Helga LaRouche traveled to Beijing, I traveled to Taipei, and we want people, we, uh, we want our Chinese friends, this is what LaRouche says, we want them in Korea and Japan, LaRouche warns Asia, this is going to happen. And people didn't really believe it. So when it happened, the, uh, I personally have had many examples where people like with the last warnings in 2007, 2008 from LaRouche, I was contacted by Chinese people saying, I heard LaRouche's warning in 1997. And now when LaRouche comes with such a warning, I listen. Uh, so it has many different ways in which uh, LaRouche's influence and teachings has been mature, maturing. This is, I must say, Mr. Ding made a very small mistake because he said that the middle route went from Xi'an um, and over to Europe. It, the uh, the uh, point it starts from, and it says right here in China, this is the eastern terminal of the Eurasian land bridge. You can see that on the sign. This is Helga Larus there at the terminal, the eastern terminal, out on the coast. It's north of Shanghai, uh, where she's been interviewed by Chinese journalists in 1997. So, but that was a minor mistake from, from Mr. Ding. So, uh, let me have the last one. Okay. This says, Chen Sha Wei Gong. And this is, um, this is uh, a saying coming from a very famous uh, piece from Confucius uh, about the great commonwealths where the, in the future, where you take care of old people, you take care of sick people and children, where no, nobody steals, you don't have to lock your door because it's a future society in great harmony. And in there, uh, Confucius had the uh, saying, Chen Sha Wei Gong, and it basically, it has many different translations, but Chen Sha means under the heaven, so that the world belongs to everybody. Uh, that is one of the ways you can translate it. So I wanted to end here by just very quickly going through um, what, how much China has done for people that don't know. I mean, uh, they have made four fast speed corridors from east to west. And when I say fast speed, I mean 325 to 350 kilometers an hour. I have been traveling with those trains. They are fantastic. They, are, they don't scramble. They are silent. You can write. Uh, and they serve uh, spring water from Tibet. I don't know if it is from Tibet, but it says so on the bottles. Um, but it's very efficient. I can give you an example. 
a, a, a travel between Beijing and Tianjin in northern China that used to take three hours, take today half an hour. It has had a great uh, influence on the population because it's very normal for a student or an old person that is not that wealthy to just take a modern train like that that we don't have of any kind in the United States or in Europe. These trains are more advanced than anything else uh, we have in the transatlantic region. And it's a certain optimism uh, that you just do that. And it has vastly improved uh, the, the capabilities. Massive water projects, the Three Gorges Dam, transfer of water from the south to the north, uh, massive work on power generation, uh, and so forth. It would be a, could be a whole thing in itself, but it's a tremendous development. And I also want to say there has been projects in China where they have really thought about lifting, where there was not so much immediate profit for the country, but to lift up areas that were very remote and uh, very poor because they were completely cut out from, from, um, from uh, transportation. Like, for example, in the rather southern part of China, you'll see a map later on between something called Nanning and Kunming. The Chinese built a railroad and the mountains go like this. And the Chinese built a railroad going through this with tunnels and railroad bridges, which immediately lifted up uh, the living standard because people for the first time could travel and transport their goods. But it also meant that there's a point now from Kunming and further uh, regarding the southern part of the uh, Eurasian land bridge. Uh, and now, very big, uh, another part I will mention, for example, is you can go from Shanghai all the way across China and up to Tibet, to Lhasa, where uh, a big part of the trip where you have to have air pressure in the cars because it's permafrost all the time in the ground and the, the pressure up there is too high because it's over 5,000 meter high. And that means through having to building new machine tools and so forth that the Chinese have gotten a, developed a whole new technology concerning extreme weather, uh, how to build railroad and permafrost, uh, how to, how to make, build machine tools that could function in these uh, extreme temperatures and so on. And then last but not least, exploration uh, of space, uh, which has inspired the whole world. And when you are in China, it is like I could imagine in the United States in the 60s, where with Kennedy's launching of us going to the moon, people are super excited about their astronauts. And if you want to have a good advertisement, you get an astronaut to be part of the, uh, the not a Hollywood star or something like that. No, you get an astronaut. Uh, so, uh, and the Chinese wants to have collaboration. You heard what was said this morning, more is going to be discussed because we have half the population of the world lives in Asia, Southeast Asia, and Asia as a whole. And the future is there. If we get changed away from imperial policies of the United States into back to what America really represented, then we have an, a future which is almost unimaginable how beautiful and uh, uh, optimistic that can be. There's nothing that we will not be able to do as mankind concerning conquering space conquering diseases, producing food. And with that, also with the earlier question regarding education policy, then the education policy will simply be spurred out of a optimism for the future and what we need to do. And on the last note, because I know there's been a lot of, either you are anti-Muslim or you are anti, I have had a personally a lot of anti-China uh, propaganda, uh, uh, where people are, that uh, somehow, this is all imperial uh, propaganda uh, in order to uh, set up uh, against, uh, set people up against each other that really, as LaRouche said in 2007, uh, China and US are inseparable. The only thing they need to do is to get married. <laughs> and if you study, I will end here because I went a little too far. If you study Confucius, uh, he believes, he says that the universe is lawfully ordered, it constantly developed in a lawful, harmonic way. Man's relationship to the universe should be uh, like that. And that the key basis regarding 
all relationships, a man's relationship to himself, a man's relationship to his fellow human being, is the idea of love on the highest level. And with that, I will end.